This program has been made possible by a grant from the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. The UCF Office of Research and Commercialization is committed to moving the discoveries of our faculty and students from ideas to innovation to realization. By moving research from the laboratory to the private sector, we are helping to diversify Florida's economy and helping to bring high paying jobs to our state. This program presents some examples of our research and our efforts to transition this research to the private sector. Welcome back to another edition of Zenith. I'm Ed Hyland. Today our focus on research will look at important work being done in the field of cancer research. We'll also get the latest on ultra-fast laser technology from a scientist who's created a laser-driven clock that is smaller than the head of a pin. Details on these stories and much more when Zenith continues. University of Central Florida Technology Incubator, cultivating success through creative ideas, performance, and partnerships. Because there's a lot of people doing a lot of work every day, and that's what everybody brings together. So it wouldn't be successful without the partnerships. The UCF Technology Incubator is a university-driven community partnership providing early stage technology companies with the enabling tools, training, and infrastructure to create financially stable, high growth enterprises. With locations in the Central Florida Research Park adjacent to the UCF campus in East Orlando and in downtown Orlando, the UCFTI is home to over 50 new and innovative high-tech companies. That's up from 12 companies when the incubator opened its doors in 1999. The incubator has created hundreds of high-paying jobs in Central Florida with an average annual salary of $59,000. <laughs> Our clients include Alenian, Netlander, SiloQuest. Three of our growing number of graduates now on their way to commercial success. Alenian develops return on investment financial analysis tools to help information technology vendors sell more effectively. Netlander is an information technology company that provides services and software professionals to government and commercial clients throughout the United States. The UCF Technology Incubator, promoting optimal corporate growth and making a significant contribution to the economic development of the region's high technology sector. The longer a man lives, the more likely he will face the possibility of prostate cancer. Now, science is making great inroads in fighting this disease, but a UCF researcher is finding that at least a part of the cure may be determined by how the patient deals with the diagnosis. I'm really interested in, in people's emotional adjustment to cancer or um, their emotional response. And, and by that I mean um, how they cope with it, how it impacts their lives, how it impacts their relationships and what they do, their work, their home life, those kinds of things. Because I think cancer, you know, it's just an emotive word. Everyone, you know, the big C and it's very scary to people. And so I've always, from the time I was a new nurse, was very interested in um, asking patients, what's this about for you? What's this like? How does it impact your family? That kind of thing.
I have worked with um, people with various different types of cancers before, and I find that there's almost sort of a unique personality depending on what type of cancer they have, which seems a little odd. But um, I've been working with, with exclusively with men now with prostate cancer for about the last seven or eight years, and I find um, that the men are very open to talking about um, their cancer and their treatment. Um, but it depends on um, sort of people, people situation in life. Some people that may be older and have had other adversities and, and dealt with those successfully have learned how to deal with things that are difficult. And so they may sort of take it in stride and say, well, you know what, I had this treatment, you know, I have my life, my family, you know, I I'm able to live a few more years, that's a good thing. You know, where other people that may be younger say, you know, I had this surgery and now I have symptoms that I have for the rest, they're going to have for the rest of my life. This has ruined my life. I, this is not something I expected. So it really sort of differs um, and you see sort of all sides of the spectrum. Some men told me their number one complaint was erectile dysfunction, and that occurs in, in quite a large number of men. Um, urinary incontinence also occurs quite readily, although that's something that, and, and, and erectile function both may resolve over time. However, in many men they do not, and many men it becomes a lifelong thing. In addition to the uh, erectile dysfunction, men, other men have said, well, urinary incontinence is the thing that bothers me the most. It's a daily thing, it's a day and night thing, whereas the erectile dysfunction, you don't do it every day, every, you know, all different times of the day necessarily, and so, you know, one can sort of figure out how to manage that problem, whereas a urinary incontinence problem affects not only you interpersonally and personally, but it affects how you interact in social relationships. It affects how you interact in business relationships. Um, you have to change your routine. Um, it can be expensive to manage. So that there's a lot more implications of that. But again, it seems like it depends sort of on the person. Age may have something to do with that. I mean, it's, again, to the degree that um, men maybe had some problem with urine leaking previously or sexual function previously prior to prostate cancer, um, they have become sort of accustomed to managing it. And so, you know, they think, well, you know, I've lived this long, that kind of thing, I can, I can deal with that, it's not a big deal. Um, and younger men um, seem to have a more difficult time with both those problems. Yeah, I think it's starting to become um, something people are talking about more. Um, in fact, um, one man told me that, you know, 10 years ago this was not a topic of conversation at all. Now he finds, um, and maybe it, it was his age, um, that this is, this is a topic of men 60 years and older that they talk about on the golf course or, you know, in business meetings or those kinds of things. So it is starting to be talked about more, but at the same time, other men have said, you know, um, men don't talk about um, sex, for instance, you know, in terms of we were talking about how um, surgery had impacted sexual function, and so this man said to me, men don't talk about sex. And so then when you have some implications in terms of I impacting function, they don't know where to go with that um, and who to talk to about that and how to resolve those issues, um, those emotional issues, the physical issues, all of the things that relate to that. So um, it's often very difficult for people. It's interesting that um, many people have asked me, well, do you have difficulty talking with these men or the, the men have difficulty talking with you as a woman? And I don't know whether it's the fact that I'm a nurse and I feel so I'm less threatening perhaps or the fact that I know the language and I know the type of surgery and I could sort of, um, you know, I know the code words kind of thing. If that allows me to become sort of an insider and I'm a safe person to talk to, but um, men have been very interested to talk. In fact, men have said thank you for doing this type of research because no one's asked me these questions before. 
Prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men, with about 240,000 cases diagnosed every year. Well, up next, we'll sit down with a world-renowned scientist who makes challenging the speed of light one of his daily assignments. The world of science is thankful that Peter Delphiette decided not to pursue his teenage passion, being a drummer. But music's loss gave way to the invention of the world's fastest, most powerful semiconductor diode laser and the first optically distributed clocking system for supercomputers. Peter's one of the lead researchers at Creole, the Center for Research and Education in Optics and Lasers at the University of Central Florida. Welcome, Peter. Thank you so much for coming by and joining us once again. Sure, Ed. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And uh, we always talk about time in Zenith, so let's talk about clocks in particular, one of your areas of expertise. Uh, and one of the things that you've been working on very, very closely is, is, is optical clocks. Tell us a little bit about why we need to improve on telling time. Sure. It's an excellent question. Um, Previously, people have been working on clocks, which they're used to hearing atomic clocks. And these things are based upon uh, atomic transitions in gases where the accuracy is about a billionth of a second. It turns out that if you can uh, improve your ability to measure time, you can improve your ability to perform measurements. And having precise measurements in the areas of manufacturing is extremely important. So in some sense, our ability to better tell time will allow folks to navigate better. For example, you'll have improved GPS positioning. You'll be able to manufacture automobile parts, you know, uh, precise to a fraction of a millionth of a meter, uh, allowing uh, engine components to work better, more fuel efficient, etc. So in some sense, you say uh, your ability to tell time, you know, that may allow you to measure the speed of light better, Better, measure a variety of uh, physical phenomena, the electron charge better, but those things really don't relate to the normal guy on the street. However, if you tell him that, gee, by making better clocks, we'll be able to have uh, a better way of manufacturing components and it will make your cars run better, your cell phones work more efficiently, then that seems to make a, a slightly better uh, a sales pitch to the normal consumer. In doing my research, uh, I, I was frankly amazed to, to realize that it's been over 50 years since the atomic clock was invented. And, and why is it taking so long for us to begin to, to essentially start to redefine the second? Right, excellent, excellent. Um, the, the, the key feature is that um, you really want to be able to have some kind of a standard where you can count the number of cycles per second. And so in the area of optics, optics is a wave, and so you can count the number of wiggles or wave peaks at uh, go by you per second, it turns out that, that that technology you could do in the microwave regime reasonably easy because you could measure the voltages and currents, you could count the cycles per second reasonably easy, but with optics, the, the number of peaks per second that go by you are on the order of um, 100 trillion peaks per second, uh, you know, several hundred terahertz, and this is extremely difficult to measure because we don't have the ability to measure uh, voltages and currents, you know, that rapidly. That's m number one. Number two is that, you know, we can generate uh, well-defined optical frequencies with lasers, and lasers didn't really become invented until, let's say, 1960, as an example. And so once you're able to develop the laser, then you have to be able to have some way in which you can um, reference or compare the color of light that you generate from your laser with some other known standard. And it's only recently, within the last few years, that we're able to now measure the accuracy of timing to maybe one part in... 10 to the 17, and so one part in 10 to the 17 would literally be about uh, uh, 100 quadrillion parts, you know, per second. So, if you will, that's a lot. It's one with 17 zeros say, behind it. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> now, 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 has this come about? You mentioned different type, different colors, basically. Yes. Now, are we still? Is this still evolving? In other words, are yes. we still finding new types of, of lasers to help us redefine time? Yes. As a matter of fact, um, it's a uh, Within the last year, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to uh, Professor Ted Hench, 
uh, to develop a, a novel type of optical frequency comb source by which you're able to um, accurately measure the optical frequency of one of these lasers which produces optical pulses with a precise timing. We call these things mode lock lasers. And he was able to show that by properly um, operating in, a, in the laser in a certain regime, you're able to measure this timing accuracy to one part in 10 to the 17. The key features that, that he has typically been looking at is for things like metrology and spectroscopy, measuring fundamental constants of the universe more accurately so we can have a better understanding of how the universe works or whether the universe will uh, kind of just completely expand or collapse back on itself or get into the steady state kind of configuration. But um, the other more commercial aspects, as I mentioned earlier, are related to using this, these optical frequency combs for things like metrology to, for better measurement in manufacturing. Also, some of the other applications are related to using these uh, frequency combs for secure communications or for effectively designing uh, laser fields to enable chemical reactions to either work faster or to in fact turn them off. So you could have chemical processes by which shining a beam of laser light on the chemical process you could either uh, enhance that chemical reaction to occur or in fact by just tweaking the laser just completely turn it off. And so again these are interesting applications that make an impact in the manufacturing and e economic sector. I want to touch on the area of, uh, of the security aspect, yeah. uh, but I know one of the uh, other areas that you've been involved in is basically the transmission of, of data and such. And, and kind of give us an update, if you will, of, on where that stands uh, sure. as far as kind of eliminating wires and some of our other forms sure. of, uh, of transmitting data and, and sure. switching over to lasers. Sure. Um, uh, several years ago, we made a little, a little uh, semiconductor laser that could transmit about a, a trillion bits of information per second. Now we have a, a new type of the semiconductor laser, which uh, immediately is saying that we could at least do two trillion bits of information per second. So we've doubled our capacity in just a few years. And using that laser and, and orthogonal components of polarization, we could easily transmit four or terabits or four trillion bits of information per second. To give you a feel for what a trillion bits of information per second is, that would be about a quarter of a million uh, cable TV channels if each cable TV channel is using com a compressed digital format. And so, you know, you probably say, you know, what are you going to do with a quarter of a million cable TV channels? Uh, that sort of boggles the mind. But the thing I'd like to try to uh, make the connection to is that, um, People use laptops and like to get on and off the internet, and their laptops runs at a, a speed of about a, a billion bits of information per second. And at UCF, in a few years, we'll have you know about uh, 50,000 students. And if everyone wants to have their laptop up and running at UCF, we'd need uh, 50, 50 trillion bits of information per second. And so this one terabit per second laser is in fact 50 times too slow. So while you may not need a quarter of a million cable TV channels in your house, I think UCF would be, would be certainly super happy to be one of the universities in the country that would allow their students and faculty to be getting on and off the internet at their rate at which their computer is really meant to operate. That would allow instantaneous downloading of video files without having to click and wait several minutes for a full download to occur. And that's that's one of the things that's happening these days is people are demanding the bigger files, the more the more uh, the larger amounts of data. I want to watch TV on my computer. I want to be able to uh, to talk to somebody uh, on, in another part of the world via my computer. That's correct. That's correct. And as as these applications develop it then does require more aggressive hardware, hardware that works faster. It then forces a computer, if you really want to run them well, and to be able to interact with people at remote locations, it really forces the technology to be able to get on and off the internet faster than what you're able to do <clears throat> with conventional uh, dial-up or even uh, DSL type technology. Now, one of the huge challenges, obviously, for any exchange uh, of, of data is, is the security aspect. Uh, right. People are very much worried about what may happen to the information that I send out or take in uh, via the Internet. Is there a way? Can you, can you work with, uh, with, with lasers and, and optics and, and come up with ways to secure that information? Sure. As a matter of fact, what we're working on now, uh, we have a, a program which is sponsored by the uh, Department of Defense on how to use lasers to be able to communicate uh, with remote locations in a secure fashion. And the concept is actually very simple. It's somewhat similar to the way the cell phones work today. And cell phones use a technology which we call uh, CDMA, or Code Division Multiple Access. And basically, <clears throat> in a nutshell, 
when you send information, whether it's uh, through electrical wires or through fiber, the information comes at you in like ones and zeros, kind of like dots and dashes. So you could listen to it, <clears throat> an eavesdropper could listen to it, and listen to the clicks, the dots and dashes, or look at the flashes of light, the ones and zeros, and they, they could in fact see what you're saying. Except what we're trying to do is uh, we take these flashes of light and we corrupt them so that if you were to in an analogous fashion, if you were to listen to an electrical signal, it would sound like hiss or white noise, kind of like if you tuned your radio uh, between stations and you just got this hissing sound. So an eavesdropper would try and tap the light from the fiber and kind of look at it and said, ah, this is just garbage signal. There's really nothing here. This is background spontaneous emission. However, <clears throat> the receiver at the other end would a priori know what kind of code you're using and would be able to, to recompress or reconfigure this hissing noise into, into usable information. And uh, that's basically what we're doing. We're very successful at that. And of course, the first thought to pop in, when you're talking about codes and deciphering, then I start thinking of hackers and, and somebody right. coming in and doing the same thing. Right. And so, good point. Um, the concept of code division multiple accent, uh, multi CDMA, is not um, perfectly secure as some kind of encryption technologies that people use today. Um, however, uh, it does make it much more difficult for a hacker to see. And the way to really frustrate a hacker is to, is to what we call code hop. That means if I'm sending you information in a CDMA fashion, you and I know beforehand what code we're going to use. And then as we transmit our information back and forth, you know, underneath inf this information, we actually tell each other that we're going to s switch to a different code. So it's kind always of, changing. Always so evolving. right. So it becomes much more difficult for a hacker to be able to, to look at the data figure out that you're using CDMA, figure out what types of code you're using, and then try to understand how you're going to code hop. That becomes extremely difficult because what, what some aspects of uh, CDMA is looking at are, is, is literally almost trying to change the code uh, literally, literally every, in every byte. So every byte might be eight bits. And so if you're going to code hop on every eight bits, and these bits are coming at you at tens of billions of bits of information per second, this would be extremely difficult for someone to be able to figure that one out. And that could be very reassuring for someone trying to get into this technology Oh, absolutely, as well. absolutely. Now, what about the size aspect? In our last couple of minutes, I was thinking if we could kind of focus in on where we're going. Everything's getting smaller. The yes. Electronics are bringing everything down. But there's still a power element. You still need to have, I would think, a certain amount of power. Lasers take a tremendous amount of energy, at least they have in the past. Yes, yeah. Can we evolve our laser systems to produce the kind of power that we need for long distance communication, for door-to-door yes. -door communication. Right. Excellent question. Um, there are several um, uh, programs being <clears throat> investigated now in the government, which is in fact addressing this question, trying to get to high efficiency from laser technology. Because in the past, if you took a look at some of the old lasers that people developed, you know, back when they first started, <clears throat> the wall plug efficiency, that's, you know, gee, how much power get I, can I get out of the wall plug versus how much power I get out of the laser, uh, that ratio was less than a percent. And so now uh, people are working with semiconductor lasers getting wall plug efficiencies of close to 80 percent. So if you're going to draw, you know, one watt of, which in one watt does not sound like a lot of power, a regular light bulb is about 100 watts in your house, but you could draw one watt of, of electrical power from your wall plug and have a one watt laser beam. A one watt laser beam will burn, will burn you. Uh, so just in terms of the amount of power and intensity that that has, and so with a one watt laser, uh, just drawing one watt of power from the wall plug, you could you could easily you know do transoceanic uh, communications without without any kind of repeater. Now that, that that amazes me when you're talking about that small amount of power being able to go that much of a distance. Sure. And that works in the field as well. I mean, I guess that would give you that option you were talking about before of, say, a military unit out in the field trying to relay information, uh, you know, from from what may be happening on the battlefront. That's correct. In in the in um, <clears throat> what we call these um, um, dynamic arenas or the battlefront, as you like to call it, uh, many times if if you're going to use optical communications, people are are thinking more of direct line of sight or free space optics. There, uh, there are more challenges in terms of doing the networking, in terms of uh, uh, relaying information between multiple, multiple uh, users or participants uh, in the arena. And so I believe right now in the near future, communications in the battlefield will still probably rely on wireless communications. 
Peter Delphiat, I want to thank you so much for coming by once again and uh, catching us up on what's happening in the world of lasers and what's underway in the way of research out of Creole as well. Absolutely, Ed. It's a pleasure to be here as usual. All right. Thank well, you. speaking of clocks and time, we have uh, just a little bit of time left, but there's always time for our Research Minute. So search is, uh, has been a model system in science for many years, actually for more than a century. The advantage of using search is that, as I said, it's a simpler, let's say, uh, model. They live, really have a long life and they only have a native immune system, so their native immune system must be very powerful in order you know, to survive. And so what we saw is that there are certain gene family, gene family of immunity, which you have few copies in a human, like eight to 10, in urchin would be 200, or another group of genes are 8,000. So there is a great expansion in, in the repertoire, let's say, of protein that can attack the pathogens. And that would be a great source for us for you know, new uh, molecule or compound or proteins to, in order to defend you know, against pathogens uh, to fight uh, infectious diseases. And we have run out of minutes to spare, but we'll have more for you to enjoy in the next edition of Zenith. The goal of research is to better understand the world around us. Our goal is to be a window to that world. I'm Ed Highland. See you next time.